What would you do if you found a dead snail in your ginger beer bottle? Can you sue the manufacturer? Hi and welcome back to the channel. In today's episode of The Case Files, we look at the famous judgment of Donahue vs Stevenson, which shaped the way we see the law today and forever changed the landscape of tort law. It's also probably the starting point of consumer protection laws. Let's get started. The story begins in the quaint Scottish town of Paisley in the early 20th century. Mrs. May Donahue and her friend visited a cafe named Well Meadow Cafe. Her friend ordered peach and ice, and Donahue asked for an ice cream float, which was a mixture of ginger beer poured over ice cream. The owner of the cafe brought over a ginger beer bottle, which was an opaque bottle, which stated that it was manufactured by Stevenson. Donahue drank some of the ice cream float, and when she emptied the rest of the ginger beer onto her tumbler, the decomposed remains of a snail fell out of the bottle. Mrs. Donahue fell ill at the sight of this snail. Mrs. Donahue suffered severe gastroenteritis and shock due to the decomposed snail in the ginger beer bottle. She decided to seek legal recourse against Stevenson, the manufacturer, alleging negligence in producing the ginger beer bottle. The case first landed in the Court of Sessions in Scotland where Donahue's legal team argued that Stevenson owed a duty of care to Donahue even though there was no contractual relationship between the parties. They argued that the manufacturer's negligence caused harm to Donahue, therefore she was entitled to compensation. On the other side, Stevenson's defense contended there was no contractual relationship between him and Donahue as she did not purchase the ginger beer bottle herself. In fact, it was her friend who had purchased it. They argued that there was no precedent for a manufacturer being held liable to a consumer with whom they had no contractual relationship. The Court of Sessions in our house, citing a similar case, Mullen vs. AG Bar, where a dead mouse had been found inside a ginger beer bottle, decided in favour of Stevenson, the manufacturer. They agreed with the defenders' argument that Stevenson was not liable because there was no contractual relationship with Donahue. However, the case didn't end there. Undeterred by this judgment, Donahue's legal team appealed to the highest court of the land, the House of Lords. The appeal set the stage for a groundbreaking legal debate which changed the landscape of negligence law. In the House of Lords, the key question became whether a manufacturer owed a duty of care to the ultimate consumer even in the absence of a contractual relationship. The crux of Mrs. Donahue's argument was that the manufacturer Stevenson owed a duty to ensure that the product was safe for consumption to the ultimate consumer. By failing to exercise reasonable care, he misrepresented the safety of the product to consumers like Donahue. This argument challenged the traditional view with regard to contractual privity, that is, that the legal obligations are limited to the parties to the contract. Instead, it proposed a broader duty of care based on reasonable foreseeability and proximity. After careful deliberation, a five-judge bench of the House of Lords delivered a landmark judgment with a majority in favour of Mrs. Donahue. Lord Atkins' famous neighbour principle formed the crux of the judgment. His lordship stated that the rule that you are to love your neighbour becomes in law, you must not injure your neighbour. You must take reasonable care to avoid acts or omissions which you can reasonably foresee would be likely to injure your neighbour. His lordship also considered who will qualify as a neighbour in the eyes of the law. Lord Atkin defines a neighbour as persons who are so closely and directly affected by my act that I ought reasonably to have them in contemplation as being so affected when I am directing my mind to the acts or omissions which are called in question. Basically, what the judge is saying is that you owe a general duty of care to ensure that you don't injure a person who you can reasonably foresee will be affected by your actions. So in this case, the manufacturer would therefore owe a duty of care to the ultimate consumer to not cause injury to her because it is reasonably foreseeable to Stevenson that his actions would affect Donahue, who is the ultimate consumer. 
this groundbreaking decision extended the duty of care beyond contractual relationships and established a precedent in negligence law which has now been adopted in most jurisdictions around the world. Basically, what this judgment means is that we may owe a general duty of care to people in our vicinity and if we breach that duty, we will be liable for being negligent. On this basis today, drivers of a car would owe a duty to their passengers and pedestrians on the road, doctors, lawyers and other professionals would owe a duty to their clients, etc. And as we speak, new situations where duties may exist are being recognized by the court using this judgment. The legacy of Donahue v. Stevenson is also profound because it not only revolutionized the law of negligence but also paved the way for consumer protection laws to develop worldwide. Today, manufacturers are being held accountable to the ultimate consumer even if they have no contractual relationship with the consumer. This is all thanks to the judgment of Donahue v. Stevenson in the 1930s. So the next time you sip a refreshing beverage, spare a thought for Mrs. Donahue and the snail that changed the course of legal history. And that's the fascinating judgment of Donahue v. Stevenson which has changed the landscape of the law and forever changed our understanding of duty of care and negligence. If you enjoyed this episode, please do consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel. And if you want to watch more episodes of this series, you can click on the link which is on the screen now. I'll see you in another episode. Take care. Bye.